Welcome to the London School of English Live. Today, our expert English language trainer, John Dyson, will share with you important tips and advice uh, on business English and particularly on how HR and managers uh, discuss performance and goals in English. We hope that you find the vocabulary and expressions from this session useful in your own business English. You can ask your questions in the live chat next to the video uh, throughout the live stream and we will answer them during a Q&A session at the end. Here with us today, we also have our colleague Faiza Afsal, who has a great deal of experience in this topic, uh, and uh, she will take part in our Q&A session too. Uh, before we start with the main content, uh, Faiza will share some information about our English training in London and online. Faiza, over to you. Thanks, Olga. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to today's live stream. Uh, thank you you so much for joining us and we hope that you find the session to be useful. Uh, as Olga said, we have a variety of courses for our clients um, who would like to specialize in business English or even English for HR. Um, so we have our business English course, which is delivered at our centers um, in London. Uh, you can take them face to face. Uh, we reopened about a month and a half ago, nearly two months ago now, and have been welcoming students Uh, we have a virtual course as well uh, that's offered for three hours a day on an intensive basis uh, for one week. And um, that's also available in different time slots if you'd like to join us from different parts of the world. We have a Business English Express course, um, and this is ideal for people who might be working on a regular basis but would like to still improve and maintain their Business English language. Um, that's delivered twice a week in 90-minute sessions on Tuesdays and Thursdays covering different business topics. Uh, many of our clients come to us for specific purposes. They might work for in a specific field like oil and gas or in the pharmaceutical sector or in technology. So we offer a variety of courses that can be tailored for specific purposes. Um, they can be delivered face to face in our center in London, or it can also be delivered online, um, sometimes as part of a combination of a group course. Uh, and then you do some one to one training or otherwise just one to one training overall. And then we, we also have a specific course for um, English for Human Resources. And this is targeted at human resources professionals. Um, it covers all the language that they would need, including the some of the language that we'll cover here today around appraisals and feedback. Um, but it also looks at, um, you know, different writing uh, skills, um, when it comes to kind of writing performance evaluations, Um, or email communication or telephone skills for interviewing and recruitment style as well. So that's an intensive one-week course that we're running face-to-face -face in London on specific dates. Um, you can find all of those courses and more information on the website at the link that Olga's got for you there. Great. Thank you very much, Faiza, uh, for this introduction. And uh, of course, uh, we can talk uh, more about this at the end of the live stream. But uh, For now, uh, John, uh, great to have you uh, here with us uh, again uh, for our Business English live stream and uh, over to you for the main content. Okay, thank you, Olga. Thank you, Pfizer. Hello, everyone. My name's John Dyson and I'm a Business English teacher here at the London School of English. I'm delighted to be with you this afternoon to talk about a subject which affects all of us in one way or another, human resources, and in particular, performance appraisal. We're going to look at some key terms and expressions connected to this very important aspect of business communication and organizational behavior. Now, we'll look at three different stages of the performance appraisal interview, and there is quite a lot of text which will appear on screen. But do remember that you can re-watch this stream on our YouTube channel whenever you want. It will be available very soon after this Uh, live stream. And remember, if you have any comments or you want to ask any questions, our chat is running right now. So feel free to contribute. So let's make a start. To begin with, uh, I'd like to do a little bit of groundwork with a group of general terms related to the area of HR and performance management. First of all, I'd like to look at the difference between three terms. These terms are evaluation, review, and appraisal. 
Now, an evaluation is really looking back. Very often, people do evaluations at the end of courses. So, for example, it may be filling in a, a form or writing some feedback. It is, generally speaking, a numerical and quantitative way of giving feedback because it's easy to process that way. A review is really looking back and reflecting on the way that you have performed certain tasks, the way you have behaved. And when we move on to appraisal, which is the, the word we're really focusing on here, there are three elements to this. First of all, there's looking back. Then there is taking stock at the present, taking stock and planning forward, planning developmental goals. So I think this word appraisal, which isn't always so familiar to people, I think is the, definitely the most appropriate um, term to use when we're talking about performance, because it's an all round look at the way somebody has done their job. Another term which is really significant, very important, is when you are assessing somebody or appraising their performance, what are you using to measure that performance, whether it's good, not so good, bad? We use a term to benchmark. And normally we benchmark against a standard. And what it means is that we create a standard which we see as being what we feel is acceptable to somebody or to a certain kind of job. And then we measure, we can measure in a certain way that person against uh, that standard. Another term we could use for that is KPIs, if you like, key performance indicators. A couple of other things I'd like to focus on. The first thing is, I think it's very, very important that in terms of communication, that we adopt the approach when we are giving feedback of active listening, because it's definitely a two-way process. So when we talk about active listening, there are three elements. We can listen actively, we can uh, refer to active listening, but there are three elements to this. The first one is to encourage the other person to participate, to encourage them perhaps by um, asking them to, to make comments themselves, to engage the other person. Again, what you're trying to do is create a two-way dialogue. And finally, to extract, which really means to extract information, to extract opinions, to extract impressions, because this is, uh, at the end of the day, what we don't want to do is talk at the person. We want to talk with the person, talk to the person. And that involves a two-way process. And another group of three words that I would refer to here are attitude, behavior, and performance. What's the difference between the three? Well, I think they all inform each other in one way or another. Your attitude is how you feel, how you think about a job, about a situation, about things you have to do. So you can feel positive, you can feel negative, you can feel indifferent. But your attitude, that is what you think and feel, has a very strong influence on your behavior. And your behavior is basically what you do what you do and how you do it. So what is performance? Well, when you put together attitude and behavior, what it manifests itself as in terms of the workplace is your performance. And that really refers to not just what you do, but the quality of what you do. So I think having looked at some of those um, key concepts let's say let's have a look at some practical language and some a, a way in which we can uh, see a performance um, appraisal in action we're going to look at a typical performance appraisal interview at three points the first part is at the beginning the second is somewhere in the middle and the last dialogue is towards the end when we might be wanting to establish some um, developmental goals so here's the first dialogue at the beginning of the interview. And it's between two women, a woman called Barbara, who is the HR uh, manager, and Julia, who is the employee. So 
Barbara welcomes in Julia. Hi, Julia, come in and take a seat. Thanks, Barbara. Barbara, now this is your six monthly performance appraisal. And what I want to do is firstly, look at your overall performance. Then we can talk about more specific parts of the job you've done. Finally, we'll create a personal development plan for you moving forward. Is that agenda good for you? So as you can see in that first part of the dialogue, we've got a very clear structure to the appraisal. So it's very clear to the um, employee in question exactly what is going to happen. It's general, it gets more specific, and then looking forward, it's moving to the future. Julia is happy with that. Yes, that sounds okay to me. Barbara continues, great. So I usually start by identifying what we see as your strengths and weaknesses. That way we can reinforce the strong points and address any weaker areas. So there's a couple of points to look at there, strengths and weaknesses. Um, strengths from the adjective strong um, and the verb to reinforce strong points, to make stronger, to, to, to drive those forward and in a way to celebrate them, to say, you know, there are always good things you can find about even the worst of employees. And address weaknesses, address any weaker areas. So we address a problem, we address an issue, we address a situation. So that's a useful verb to use there. Uh, Julia says, will I get the chance to make comments too? And Barbara responds, of course, feel free to come in at any time. We very much want this to be a two-way process. So I think in that final part of the, the this first part of the dialogue, we can see that Barbara is setting the terms of the interaction, if you like, and she's making it very clear that this is not a one-way channel of communication and that uh, Julia is very much a participant. Okay, moving on to the second part of the first dialogue. A little complicated, isn't it? The second part of the first dialogue. <clears throat> this is a little later in the interview and Barbara is just finishing off a sentence saying, we see you as a very highly motivated and helpful member of the team. You really live our core values. Highly motivated, helpful, both very positive adjectives and living the core values. So the person behaves and the person acts and speaks and communicates in a way which is taking forward what the company considers to be important. Core values are the fundamentals of what the company stands for. Very, very common nowadays. When you go to company websites, you will see a lot of references to our values because it's what people expect nowadays. And Julia says, well, I'm very happy here. And Barbara compliments her to compliment. That shows. I just have a couple of concerns about your time management. Your manager, Tom, commented on your reliability. It isn't a big problem, but on some occasions you've missed deadlines for submitting documentation to colleagues. So then we can see that uh, Barbara talks about concerns. She doesn't say worries or problems or uh, something rather more dramatic like that. She says concerns. Now, you could say, well, that's a little bit too indirect if it's a really big problem. <clears throat> I think we have to be very careful about how we phrase information which could be perceived as being negative. It is honest feedback, but I think we have to be careful with our use of language here. And the issue is time management, which I think is a very common problem. Uh, people have a lot of priorities. People don't always do the things they need to do straight away. Um, so it's not a question of competence and it's not a question of attitude. It's simply a question of being able to manage your workload. So it refers to deadlines and documentation. And Julia goes on, oh, yes, I know I need to improve. And Barbara reinforces by saying, and you can improve. So very positively oriented. Anyway, we really appreciate your willingness to learn. 
you've self-educated a lot, which has made you quite an expert in your area. So Barbara finishes that interaction by being very positive. She um, encourages Julia to believe that she can improve, get better. And she also makes a, a reference to two things, willingness to learn, which is always important in an organization, and also the fact that she's made an effort by studying herself, by finding out more about her subject area. So that's the end of the first dialogue. And I just want to take a quick pause to comment on something um, which you may or may not have picked up on. And that's what I would call the feedback hamburger. Now, you may ask yourself, what has a hamburger got to do with feedback? Well, it is a widely accepted model for giving feedback in the sense that you have two pieces of bread and a piece of meat in the middle. The bread is positive. The meat may be less positive, a little more developmental, could call it negative. And the idea is that you give a positive piece of feedback, which is developmental, constructive, and then a negative piece of feedback, if you have some, if there's something you need to raise, but then you finish with another piece of bread and it's positive feedback again. So if you like, you're kind of inserting the negative feedback between two sets of positive feedback, which then lessens the blow because we have to bear in mind that it, we cannot control how people interpret the feedback. They may be very take it very personally. So it is a model that is frequently used. It's very... Uh, regarded as being a, let's say, strategic way of giving feedback. Okay, so that was the parenthesis. Now let's move on to the second dialogue. And in this dialogue, we're going to go into a little bit more detail. So we're looking at um, the output and the productivity. So as we can see, Barbara begins the dialogue by saying, okay, moving on, your output shows a good level of productivity. <clears throat> so in this case, it is measurable feedback. Your output is what you produce. And good productivity means you are producing a lot, whatever it may be. And Julia says, well, I work a lot of hours. Now that shows enthusiasm, that's, that's good. But Barbara picks up on that. She's very sensitive to that. And she says, make sure it's not too many. We don't want our employees to suffer from burnout. Make sure you have a healthy work-life balance. And Julia replies, yes, yes, I'll try not to, uh, to overdo it. So as you notice, uh, I'm sure you perhaps you heard of the term burnout, to suffer from burnout, meaning exhaustion. Um, far too much, you're taking on excessive amounts of work. And uh, it's a very common subject right at the moment since the, we've all been through this terrible pandemic that a lot of people are working from home. And in many cases, this is going to affect their work-life balance because it's very easy, if this is work, it's very easy to see your work to go up and your your life, the rest of your life, your personal life, not to keep pace with that. So you have to make sure that you're keeping a good balance between work and life, a healthy work life balance. Because the problem is, otherwise you overdo it. You do too much. Okay. And Barbara then takes it back to the time management. And she says, well, perhaps it comes back to time management. You are very effective, but sometimes you need to be more efficient at it at times. So as you can see, we've got two words which very often people use interchangeably. Personally, I don't think they are exactly the same thing. I think effective means the result is good. The effect is positive. So you can be very effective, but maybe you need to be more efficient Efficient means, are you doing things in the right way? And the one often goes with the other. Somebody once said to me that efficient means doing things right, while effective means doing the right things. 
And in the first case, doing things right means doing things correctly. So, for example, you may have a salesperson, a sales representative, who is fantastic at selling products, sells a lot of products, but never fills in their paperwork on time. Not very efficient and not very helpful to other members of that person's team. So, yeah, those two, um, and Julia, of course, ends the dialogue saying, yes, I suppose so. So she doesn't sound tremendously enthusiastic, but then, you know, it is a, a sort of piece of negative feedback, but also given with positive feedback. You're very effective. Great. Not so efficient. Maybe that needs work. OK, moving on to the second part of the dialogue. Barbara continues, <clears throat> regarding your customer focus tasks, you've shown great creativity in problem solving. We like it when staff use their initiative in situations where there isn't an immediate solution. We also see the value of your soft skills. You're very competent when it comes to dealing with potentially difficult situations. You can't put a price on that. And Julia says, thank you. So creativity is a very important part of performance feedback and very often in this case creativity is not such an easy thing to measure but you can spot it if you're a good hr manager you will spot when somebody is being creative and the other interesting thing is use your initiative so we have two expressions use your initiative and to take the initiative <clears throat> and this means to use your own judgment and your own opinions and ideas about what to do in a certain situation now, this depends on the organization because there are many organizations that don't really like you to do that. But there are certain ones, probably quite a lot nowadays, where they're not going to tell you everything you have to do. And if you demonstrate that you can use your initiative, that's a very, very good quality to have. Because Barbara goes on to talk about soft skills. Now, we've got hard skills, which are things like knowing how to use PowerPoint or Excel, knowing how to be an uh, operations manager, knowing about finance and accounting. But the soft skills, meaning the way you communicate your interpersonal impact on other people, your negotiating skills, for example, your skills at dealing with conflict resolution, are also very important, but maybe less easy to measure. So I think the fact that these key words, you've got good soft skills, you're competent. And she ends it with a very nice phrase, you can't put a price on that. Which means that is so valuable that it's got no price tag on it. Very, very um, positive feedback there. And then Barbara moves on to another area. She says, Julia, how would you assess your feelings about working in teams? And Julia says, well, I think I collaborate well with colleagues, but sometimes I'm a bit quiet in team meetings. <clears throat> and Barbara says, yes, I agree. That's a pity because you have a lot of valuable ideas. You need to get them out there. At least you are sufficiently self-aware to recognize that this area needs work. That's positive. So again, we're talking about teamwork, again, something really important in organizations. And uh, in this case, Julia says the right things. I think I collaborate. Collaboration is a very important part of teamwork. But she also admits that at a personal level, she's a bit quiet. She doesn't say very much. And Barbara, I think, values that insight that Julia has into herself. A prayer is a pity because you have a lot of valuable ideas. It's very positive. You need to get them out there. But she also makes a remark about the fact that Julia is self-aware. I think this is a very, very important part of, let's say, appraising your own performance. Where do you think your strengths and weaknesses are? Self-awareness is a very valuable quality. Don't go too far. Don't get obsessed with analyzing your actions and your behavior and your thoughts. But I do think it's very useful in order for you to be able to contribute as a recipient of feedback, to contribute to the 
um, the feedback process, the assessment process. So let's just, that's the end of the second dialogue. Let's just take another um, quick parenthesis while we talk about um, two other aspects of feedback, giving feedback to other aspects of appraisal. And these are things which are measurable from things which are harder to measure. And I think in the case of feedback, many people say, well, if it's measurable, it is objective. It is quantitative feedback. So you can count the number of sales, for example, that somebody has done during a month. That's relatively easy. And in that case, you can benchmark that against a target, say, OK, the target is 12 sales. You've uh, sold 14. That's excellent. So we can measure that. Your performance is very good. Other things like, for example, collaboration. Maybe that's a more abstract concept and it's not so easy to measure. It's a little harder to measure. And then inevitably, the feedback, the appraisal becomes more subjective because that is qualitative feedback, not quantitative. So qualitative means focusing on the quality of performance. Quantitative, as the name suggests, refers to the quantity of what somebody has done, their output, their productivity, their number of sales, for example. OK, we're going to talk about, <clears throat> before we go into the third dialogue, which is talking uh, towards the end of the interview, we're just going to focus on a model which many of you may have heard of, but we'll have a look at it in a little bit of detail. And this is called SMART, SMART Objectives. Now, SMART Objectives, uh, the, the letters each stand for something. And when you're setting goals, establishing objectives, uh, creating aims for yourself or for another person, it's quite a useful model. It's quite an old model, but it's useful. So S in the SMART means specific. That means be very precise. Don't be vague. Don't just say you need to improve your contributions in team meetings. That's not specific. And we'll see what we mean by smart goals later on, because we, it, it comes out in the dialogue. The second one is M for measurable, meaning is it possible to measure this? Is it possible to quantify this? Now, it may be, it may not be. We're, very often we can find ways of measuring something simply by counting the number of times that we try to do something. I will see an example later. The third one is achievable. Is, is this possible to be achieved by a person? Does it match their capabilities? So it's no good giving a goal to somebody if it's far too difficult for their level of experience, their level of competence, their level of knowledge. So it needs to be achievable. R is for realistic. And realistic means is it actually logistically possible for this person to achieve this goal in, let's say, the amount of time that they have available or um, the resources that I, they have available to use? So they might be able to achieve it, but if it's an unrealistic goal, they're not going to be able to, even if they're capable of it. And the last one is timely. Now, this is sometimes also called time limited. And what it means is when you're establishing goals or setting goals, what it is a good idea to do is to have a certain period of time and say, OK, in the next two months or in the next three months, you will do this, this, this and this, rather than just saying, OK, well, you need to try and uh, contribute more to team meetings. That's not very specific and there's no time involved. You need time because... What is good, just as in project management, is to have milestones. Milestones means moments when you stop and take stock and say, am I achieving my aims? Or maybe I need to alter my aims a little bit because it's not realistic. 
or I'm not fulfilling them. So I need to go back and revisit the purpose of that objective. Okay, that's the little parenthesis there. Let's move on to the final dialogue. Now, this dialogue is about is uh, occurs at the end of the appraisal, the performance appraisal interview. And Julia begins, well, Julia is just finishing off her sentence as we join the dialogue. And Julia says, which is what I hope I can do in the next two years. OK, so that was part of a, a sentence from a previous part of the dialogue. And Barbara says, well, Julia, I think you will be a strong candidate with two more years experience. So they've obviously been talking about some kind of internal job position that, that Julia is interested in applying for. So shall we set some goals and objectives for the next six months? Now, remember, this is a six monthly performance review. So what she's saying is this is the, the, the performance review and at the next performance review, we will be able to assess or measure your progress. And Julia, very astutely, says, OK, can we start with my time management? And Barbara says, OK, I suggest the following. In the next two months, make sure you intervene at least twice in each team meeting with an idea or an opinion. Count them. Then you can move up to three. What do you think? So in that last statement, Barbara is very much using SMART goals. So she's quantifying the number of interventions in the meeting. She's saying during which period, and if it goes well, she can increase her aims. She can widen her aims. And at the end, she says, what do you think? So she's asking Julia to have some kind of input and some kind of collaboration in the uh, in this process. She's not imposing these aims. The aims very much need to be um, a collaborative creation. So then we move on to the second part of the dialogue. And Julia says, yes, I can do that. It'll give me a focus. And Barbara looks for more. What else could you do? And Julia, who we could assume is feeling quite relaxed and engaged in this process because she's coming out with some good ideas. She says, well, another idea I was thinking about is perhaps I could meet with Tom every morning for 10 minutes just to establish my priorities for the day. Now, if you remember, Tom is Julia's line manager. So she's she's generated this idea that it would be good for her time management, which is at the moment, it's a little bit of an issue that if she can do that, she can prioritize what her workload for the day. And I think this is a very important concept of ownership. When we talk about owning something, it means it belongs to us. It is our possession. And the idea of ownership in this case means if you suggest the solution, you are more likely to fulfill that solution because you own that solution. It's not a solution that somebody has given to you or bought for you. You own it. And Barbara is suitably impressed. It's a good idea. I think that would help a lot with your time management to prioritize your daily tasks so that you can organize your workload. So there we've got priorities, the verb to prioritize, daily tasks, and organizing workload, which, if you like, are the nuts and bolts of everyday work. We have a workload and we need to decide in what order we are going to carry out our daily tasks. Right, so we reach the end of the data. Good, I think we've covered a lot of ground this morning. Well done, Julia. Let's meet again in six months time and assess your progress then, as well as praising your successes. So there you are, a positive ending which creates a good feeling as the employee ends the interview and departs. Yeah. And remember, we've got that verb 
praising. And that's the verb to praise means when somebody does something good, if you're in a superior position to them in an organization, you're a manager, you should praise them. Well done. Excellent work. That's a really good job you've done there, John. I'm praising myself here. So to praise, uh, ask yourself, is your organization a praising organization? Do managers thank you if you've done something really good, if you've performed above expectations? It says something about an organization's culture if this is a praising organization. Because I think when you say to somebody, well done, then it makes them feel better about their performance. So I hope that that uh, brief overview of performance appraisal in the human resources management sphere has given you plenty of food for thought. Food for thought. Have a little think about it. And remember, if you want to comment, feel free. That's the, uh, the end of my presentation. I will hand you back to Olga. Thank you very much, John, for this excellent live stream and uh, uh, for so many uh, useful expressions and vocabulary uh, related to business English and uh, specifically HR topics that we've discussed here. And uh, I wanted to call out uh, um, a few uh, people in our uh, live stream saying, Anna Maria Kiampe is saying, very clear lesson, thank you very much. Uh, Rafael is saying, interesting and very well done, thank you. And uh, uh, P. Uh, Gibson, uh, so I'm sorry, I, I don't know your uh, name, but I uh, appreciate uh, you doing this. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's really great. And we also have our alumni here. Uh, Frank uh, is here with us. So that's really great Welcome to uh, see you back. Welcome Hello, back, Frank. Frank. <laughs> uh, so um, so uh, just, just to say uh, to our viewers that, as usual, we would be very happy to answer any of, the, of your questions related to business English or learning English in general or specifically regarding this topic of HR English. Uh, so please uh, share your questions and comments in the live chat next to the video. Perhaps share if you um, need to uh, deliver uh, appraisals as part of your work. Uh, and uh, whether that's in English and uh, how it go, how uh, you you're finding it. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the question to uh, Pfizer and John uh, mm -hmm. Pfizer, I, I know that uh, you actually have quite a lot of experience in this topic. So yeah. um, perhaps we can start by um, by talking about uh, the purpose of appraisals. Um, mm -hmm. I guess it, 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 it's also different depending uh, depending on a specific organization. But if you can share your thoughts on this, that'd be really great. Definitely. Um, and thank you, John, so much. That was a very uh, useful session um, with a lot of good. Um, I think for, for many people, an appraisal is that opportunity to sit down and reflect. Um, as John mentioned, you know, you'll be looking at different um, performance indicators, you'll be looking at different um, action points, but often um, when you're working, there isn't time necessarily to right. stop and to think about, okay, is are, are things working? Are they not working? Could they be better? Am I doing them? Like like we saw in, in the case of Julia and Barbara with their discussion that it was pointed out to her that, you know, what you're doing is effective, but it's not efficient. And it's only when you can take that moment to take a step back and reflect that you can then implement some change. So appraisals are that opportunity um, to stop and consider if something's working or if something's not working. Um, there, um, and John, you mentioned this a lot about being a two-way dialogue and having active listening. It's as much an opportunity for the employee as it is for the employer. Um, 
I know in my years that, you know, there are times where if I know that I have an appraisal, I get nervous and being like, oh, no, somebody's going to be looking at my work and checking. Is it OK or is it not? And you can come with that energy towards it. Um, and that certainly happens at the start of your career. But as I've moved through and, you know, you end up being on both sides, if you go into any kind of management positions, you recognize that there's also a wonderful opportunity for you to advocate for yourself and say, you know, this is what I think would be great, or this is what would be helpful. Um, I think in, like you mentioned as well, John, in any good organization, are you actively listening? Are you asking for feedback? Are you praising people? Are you acknowledging good work? Um, and an appraisal is that opportunity as well. Um, to make sure that you are, that you're hearing what your employees have to say and that you're also, um, taking hopefully the time uh, to then reflect on that and to, to action that. So um, they're very important for you, for you to, to ensure that you have a pulse on the people um, because at the end of the day, they're what helps any company. Um, you know, there might be processes, there might be products, there might be all sorts of systems in place, but you need to make sure that the people involved um, feel as though they have that opportunity to voice, you know, that this is what I'd like to do and this is what I'd like to achieve. Great, thank you, Faisa. And John, uh, would you, uh, do you have anything to add uh, to, to this question? Well, just very, very briefly, yes. I would uh, echo once again what Faisa said about active listening and um, how important it is that you are demonstrating that, not only through the words you use, but your body language, for example. Um, and when you ask questions, using coaching questions, questions which encourage the other person to open up, to give you information, and also to think of solutions for themselves. I think very often we know the solution deep down, but if somebody says, okay, what you need to do is this, 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 and this, it's not your solution. It's a solution which, in a sense, is being imposed on you. Mm -hmm. um, just the other point I would make is that I think in terms of actually using language, I think we have to be very careful about how we phrase our words, how we phrase the information we want to get across to people. Because there's a big difference between saying your performance has been very unsatisfactory and your performance could do with a few improvements. Mm -hmm if you see what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Those yeah. two messages are going to be interpreted in different ways. Exactly. Um, yeah, and I feel just one very quick last point, which is about, you know, working at the London School of English, there is a big mixture of subjective and objective feedback, and the subjective mm -hmm. feedback is very often through observing classes. Managers observe us teaching and give us very useful developmental feedback. Uh, the objective part of it is much easier to measure, and they can say, mm -hmm. John, you forgot to fill in your class attendance sheet three times last year. Yeah. So make sure you improve on that area. And that is also actionable. So I think there needs to be a kind of mixture of the two things, but yeah. never us underestimate the importance of praise. That's, yeah. that's, that's great. Thank you, John and Faisa. And uh, I think it's uh, also important to, uh, to mention that of course, uh, the London School of English is not just uh, English vocabulary and expressions. It's actually, uh, it's actually, uh, helping people to uh, improve their communication skills and knowing uh, how to um, how to express themselves uh, depending on the context and the situation uh, mm -hmm. and uh, we actually have quite uh, uh, some some questions and comments uh, from our viewers first of all sure. Sonia uh, just mentioned that she started her lessons today with John and it's still oh. That's nice. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, Thank Sonia, you. that's uh, that's really great uh, to hear. And um, uh, we, uh, we and, have... and well done also for uh, continuing your training today beyond the lesson you had with John. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> <Yes. lesson. laughs> yeah. Well, I and, recommend. Uh, we... <laughs> uh, <okay. laughs> and we have a question from Frank, uh, uh, our alumni, um, who is uh, actually specifically asking not just about English language, but about the communication uh, mm. the skills here as well. Uh, John and Faisa, what would you, uh, how, how would you answer this question from Frank that we're showing on the screen right now? Mm, that's it's tricky. A, yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Um, and it's also a very delicate question. And as Olga was saying, um, this is where sometimes it can help 
to consider the context and the situation. Um, and a little bit of what um, John was saying as well in terms of how you can phrase something and have it be delivered in a better way or not. So um, you need to approach it so that it's not as though you're pointing out an error because that's not necessarily going to be received well. If you're saying to somebody, oh, you forgot this, or you made a mistake, and I should have had this, and I didn't, that's not going to go as well as, for example, saying, um, you re I recall that for this piece of work, there was a discussion about these benefits. Hmm. Um, so you can frame it back to why you have an expectation of the reward. So for example, I work in sales, and it could be that you were told that if you reached a specific sales target, then you would have a specific benefit. So if I were in this situation, I would say it was my understanding that if I were able to achieve my goal, then there would be this expectation, has something changed? You give somebody the opportunity to then say, oh, right, sorry, I forgot. Or, oh, yes, of course, the situation has changed and we've altered and we've done this. Now, um, for example, very recently, because of COVID, a lot of things have changed and a lot of things have changed for businesses that they might not have been able to do things in the same way that they would have done before. So, you know, asking them that open ended question of being like, has something changed or has, could you kindly clarify or is there a change in the timeline, at least makes it less than did, was there a mistake or, um, is that not happening again? Like, again, you kind of need to phrase the question in an open way so it doesn't shut down the conversation either as being like, you don't want the other person to be on the back foot, especially if you're asking for something. Um, so yes, that would be, that'd be how I'd approach that one. <laughs> what do you think, John? I agree with you, Faiza. I think you've said it all there. I, yeah, I think you need information and we need information about mm -hmm. the context. And rather than getting angry or annoyed, then it's much better, obviously, to try and stay calm and to find out why. Because maybe the explanation will be satisfying. Maybe not, but you need to find out the information. But I think you, you made a lot of good points there. Yeah. I'd, I'd also say you can ask for clarification. <laughs> so, you know, they could give you the answer. If yes. It's not what you expected. <laughs> maybe yes. say Absolutely. not. Yeah. I see what you mean. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Could you expand on that point? Well, that, using that kind of language, yes. Exactly. Yes, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Great. And we've got another question from uh, Anna Maria, uh, who is interested in uh, family law uh, and uh, is asking us about uh, questions related uh, to this topic. So, uh, Faiza, would you like to... Answer yes. This. So um, we have various live streams that we've done that cover kind of the legal English sphere and area. Um, in our legal English courses, actually, uh, we, we've got one for people who are aged between 20 and 30, and we're actually starting our next intake on Monday. Um, and there, you know, we cover different areas of law and I think including some family law. Um, we have a um, London School Online platform. Uh, that has a lot of legal English vocabulary that would have things related to and around family law. Um, so yes, we have we have virtual courses which we're running, for example, from Monday. We also have face-to-face -face courses that we'll be delivering throughout um, the coming months in the summer. And then we also have a one-week course, for example, for people who have been practicing commercial law. Um, and, and that's scheduled at different points throughout the year. So um, those are available in groups. Uh, otherwise, if you're interested in any one-to-one -one training, we can certainly provide um, language training that's tailored to, to family law. And we have quite a bit of expertise um, from our trainers from delivering the other courses. So uh, let us know. You can visit us at londonschool.com or email us at clients at londonschool.com. Great. Thank you, Faiza. And uh, we... Uh, unfortunately need to uh, wrap up our session uh, because we've covered quite a lot of ground but yes. uh, but of course uh, we only uh, can cover so much in one single session however Pfizer before we do mm -hmm. um, I would like to ask you one more question because you mentioned our corporate English training at the beginning of the live stream can you tell yes. us a little bit more about this yes um, so we work with a lot of companies uh, to support them with their English language training for their employees. 
Um, one of the things also that we found is for many international uh, companies, their language might be English, for example, for all of the employees, but on a local level, um, they'll be operating in, in their local language. Um, and so actually for some of the companies we work with, when employees have appraisals, one of the metrics, one of the KPIs, the key performance indicators that they'll be measured against is their English level. Um, so it can be very helpful uh, for companies to, to reach out to us so that we can then help those employees reach the goals that they need so that they can perform at the right level um, for their company. And then likewise, that's the motivation for why a lot of our clients are coming from these corporate companies as well, um, because we help them to then, you know, be able to improve in their work, to be able to communicate clearly. Um, you know, a lot of the language, for example, that you were looking at in the dialogue that John was covering are things that we would cover in our business English course of like, you know, you're having these meetings, you're having these negotiations, how do you ensure that um, they're the best uh, for you? So yeah, we we work with individuals, we work with the companies and we work with different groups. So um, we have a variety of courses available. As always, if you have any questions or you'd like to learn a little bit more, um, then you can contact us at clients at London School and we'd be happy to share with you about what we have for different corporate companies. Yeah, thank you, Faiza. And in fact, we have quite a lot of information on our uh, website from business English courses for individuals but, uh, in groups uh, or individual lessons, but also uh, we have a section on our website uh, which specifically talks about corporate English training, uh, which yeah. you can find. Uh, so uh, that's a screenshot from this uh, from this section. So you can find uh, more in terms of the training as well as language testing and assessment that we deliver for companies as well. Yeah. So yeah, that's, uh, that's great. Um, uh, on this note, uh, I would like to say, uh, John and Pfizer, thank you so much for joining the session and uh, for this fantastic tips and uh, advice, um, both uh, uh, both uh, re regarding English uh, language, but also regarding communication skills, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, which is something that the London School of English is, uh, you know, really strong in. And then we also would like to say. Of course, thank you so much to uh, to our viewers. Uh, I will probably not be able to uh, uh, to uh, mention everyone who participated specifically in the live chat and then uh, viewed uh, viewed this live stream. But thank you, Anna Maria, Frank, Sonia, uh, and uh, um, and and many many more uh, who joined us uh, and who I'm sure will be also watching this video uh, late in the recorded uh, version as well. Thank you so much, and uh, we hope that you have a wonderful uh, rest of the day, and uh, you can always come uh, to us with any questions related to English training, or whether that's business English general or corporate English training. So uh, we hope to see you soon, and uh, thank you again for today. Thanks, thank everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. <laughs>